Hello, I'm Jim. Um, I couldn't see any of you last time. Uh, give me a wave if you just heard me talk about graphs. All right, cool. So uh, about half or so. Uh, so I'm going to do a little bit of a recap about where we are in graphs. So you guys can have a little snooze. Um, and then I'm going to do some live coding on, on Neo4j. And um, with the intent being that by the end of this session, um, you guys are going to feel comfortable writing some basic graph matching, some basic graph algorithms. We're going to look at the, the retail space and look to do some uh, retail recommendations. So this is a really, really, really condensed version uh, of a tutorial where normally we spend two days in a classroom with you guys doing all of the typing and me doing all of the sitting around. This is reversed. I'm going to do all of the typing, and you guys get to do all of the sitting around. Uh, but do pay attention. Uh, I can see you now. The lights are, uh, are on. So uh, thanks for coming. And turn it off, turn it on again, and it works. So what we're going to do, we're going to look at where we are in data now, mostly. We're going to look at imprisoned data and look at where graph theory comes from. And then going to teach you the entirety of the labeled property graph model, all of it. So be prepared. It's really, really complicated. And uh, talk about connected data, talk about how to model connected data, how to make uh, performance and high fidelity graph models, and think about how we might use a whiteboard. Before then, we go into some live coding, which almost never goes wrong, um, and uh, wrap, up with, uh, uh, wrap up with any conclusions. Uh, in the meantime, um, because I can see you guys, uh, if you want to ask questions like that guy, he's like, yeah, asking a question already. <laughs> if, if you want to do, he, he's, my, he's like my assistant. He was just showing you how to ask a question. If you want to ask a question, just wave your hands, and one of the ladies at the front will dash to you with a microphone so you can uh, ask a question we can all hear. Uh, or indeed, if you want to heckle me or you know, ask me to leave, that's, that's OK. You, you can do that too. I, I don't mind. So where are we? We're here. We've seen this, right? We've seen the complexity of these kind of schemas uh, just explode over the last few years. And particularly when we start to do path operations on the database, we're finding them to be extremely expensive and extremely unpredictable. We have reached the end of what tables can usefully do to us. We're looking for alternative data models to pick up where relational has got us to. Uh, and mark my words, relational has got us very far. Um, but we're now looking to pick up other data models to take us even further. So we have key value stores, we have column stores, we have document stores. And these things, as I, as I talked about momentarily, uh, uh, moments ago, are all similar insofar as they store and retrieve aggregates. This is the term that Martin Fowler and Promote Sadledge used to describe the characteristics of these databases. They work brilliantly when your storage and retrieval are symmetric. But when you want to slice and dice your data, when you want to mix in different dimensions of data, they fall flat. And you end up having to use some kind of external compute infrastructure or you know, JavaScript MapReduce, which sends terror into my heart, actually, uh, in order to make sense of your data. You can't simply do a pivot table on these things very easily because they're not connected. Any connections or joins, that's your problem. That's code you have to write and maintain. Because the data is effectively imprisoned. Uh, and what we have to do to, to process it is, is jailbreak it. We have to burst it, break it out of prison, put it through our processing infrastructure, and then if we're sensible, take the results of that processing and drop it back in the database. It's a fine thing. You know, this, this model has some advantages. It particularly is suitable for very, very large scale parallel processing if your data will allow. Um, but what it's not terribly suited for is making sense of connected data in real time. It tends to be a much more latent operation. That jailbreak, where you rip your data out of its womb, out of its sort of swimming around in the, in the womb, having a lovely day, and then suddenly you're like into the sausage machine that is Hadoop. This is a bit interpretive. Hadoop does not actually make these noises. Of course, at, at high scale, but still. And then eventually, ping, out comes your, your, your data. Great. Bit too slow for, for being in the clickstream there. So we are really at this very interesting crossroads, I think, in data technology. To the left, we have got most of NoSQL, You're designed primarily for scale. Not designed for insight or connected data or blah, 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 but designed just to deal with large volumes of data. And that has, cer that has certain design uh, implications. 
On the right side, you've got the graph databases like Neo4j, designed for connected data, and that also has certain design implications. Uh, notably, that the way that we interact with a graph database is by query, not by compute. So the, the idea in a graph database is that we build a high-fidelity model, and, and then we ask questions of that model, and the database is performant enough such that we can get answers to our questions in real time. And I mean real time, not in the academic sense, I mean real-time in the sloppy sense that we software engineers use it. You know, a database is not a real-time system. It, has not it does not have safety-critical properties. Please do not build your airline guidance system on Neo4j. It, it will not be give you those guarantees. Uh, MongoDB probably will. Um, don't fear the graph. Graphs initially seem difficult because they have an extremely poor reputation from academia. You know, we talk about the old crusty guy who teaches you graph theory at university, and most software engineers hated those days, right? We just wanted to build stuff. We were mad hackers who wanted to build things, and those things were, were off-putting. Actually, graphs, you know them. It, you, you just don't know that you know them. This is a map of uh, the London Tube Network. H how many of you have, have used the Tube? Lots of you, brilliant. Um, so let me set you a challenge. So later on today, I'm going to fly into uh, London Heathrow, and the Neo4j office is here at Southwark. Ha and Heathrow's down here. I'm going to fly into this guy, Terminal 5. Uh, how do I get from Heathrow to Southwark? Taxi. Yeah, OK. So <laughs> let's assume that we're in. 2014, where the world is broken and we're all poor. Now, how do I get from Heathrow to Southwark? Any Norwegians in the audience? Right, only Norwegians can afford taxes in Europe, it turns out. Uh, the rest of us are far too poor. So we know the rules, right? We know if I'm starting here, my next hop can't be here. So there's already, we know some rule about how to use this graph, or any graph. We know that we can only traverse from connected uh, uh, from connected node to connected node. So I can go from 5 to 3 to Hutton Cross to blah, to blah, to blah, to blah. Now I get here, where might I go? Well, I could go up here and then go along the central line and then change at, say, bank and then go on the black line down to here and then I can go, and then I can go you know, that's, that's one path. Yeah, that's a path through the graph. A anyone want to offer a better path? Come on, it's a graph. It's not hard. If you have children, they can do this with their fingers. Uh, 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 I would suggest going up to there. This is Green Park, where the Queen lives. Um, notice the Queen. Yeah, you have a Queen. We have the Queen. That's the way it works. Uh, <laughs> a lot of my colleagues are Swedish. They don't. Go, they don't like that either. Uh, so a Green Park, and then I can change onto the Jubilee line, go down here, and end up at Southwark, which is where my office is. Actually, I think that's probably the shortest path through this graph. So we just, in wetware, we just implemented Dijkstra's algorithm there, sort of, right? So it turns out you already know how to use graphs. They're already very familiar to you. It's just very few of us are using them in our databases right now. Um, yeah, I, I do. I do like. Uh, I do like it when I, when I see my, my American colleagues come into town and, you know, these are people who know graphs and they always end up you know, up here somewhere. Or, or worse, down here, this is where you get stabbed. And they're all like, hey, I, where is Southwark? <laughs> you what? Where is Southwark? And of course, we fuck with the Americans, it's called Southwark. But Southwark, we spell it Southwark. And then they get stabbed to death and that's fine. Um, there we go. So it turns out you already know graphs, apart from if you're one of my colleagues who is seemingly unable to navigate the tube network. Also, they have big luggage, really, really big luggage, and they call it carry-on. How is that? They can't even lift it, and it's called carry-on. Fuck them. Anyway. <laughs> Sorry, that was completely unrelated to graphs. I just thought, you know, we'd share a bit, get to know one another a bit better. Yeah. Anyway, so you already know graphs. And it comes from this guy, right? I mean, I like this guy. I also think that in IT, we should be a bit more professional, like this guy. If you, if you look at, say, the legal professionals, in particularly in the Anglo system, they all wear these wigs. You know, it gives them a sense of, uh, you know, kind of uh, intellectual importance, gives them a sense of grandeur. I think we should start wearing them, don't you? I mean, mostly because that. 
Thanks for setting up the cameras and the lights, just so. That's, uh, that's fantastic. Um, so anyway, we wear wigs. Uh, oh come on, there are a few of us that could do with a wig, right? Let's, let's admit it, yeah? Um, I think it'd look cool. Although I think hipsters might start wearing them anyway because they're really, really retro. So this is Leonard Euler, he's a Swiss mathematician. And it turns out that Euler was kind of like the first lisp guy. He's lazy, but in a good way. So it turns out that like the Emperor of Prussia wants to visit the town of Konigsberg. It's, it's Kalingrad now. And the river Pragel uh, flows through uh, Konigsberg. And the Emperor of Prussia has said, look, I really want to see this town, but I want to invest minimal effort in seeing this town. Because that's what royal people are like, right? They're lazy. So the problem is set forth. I want to cross, I want to visit the whole of Konigsberg, but I want to cross each of the seven bridges once and only once. Make it so. So you imagine now lots of like flunkies start walking around Konigsberg. They're like, uh, across the bridge. Ah, oh, shit, I've been on this one before. Okay, start again. Walk around, cross the bridge. Yep, good, good, good. It's imaginary. You have to imagine the bridges. Come on. You're not doing any typing. You could at least do a bit of imagining. Ah, oh, shit, I've been on this bridge before. Euler is smarter than that. Euler is like, Nah, walking round, that's, that's, that's for idiots. That, that, that's, that's for uh, people who graduated in the humanities. I'm a mathematician. <laughs> that was cheap, wasn't it? Uh, but then they're not here because they haven't got proper jobs. Uh, Euler is smarter. I'm actually going to completely undermine my own argument now when I tell you how cool graphs are in the humanities. Euler notices this has got nothing to do with bridges and rivers and towns and, and, and uh, you know, uh, princes and so on or emperors. Uh, it's got everything to do with the fact that you've got stuff connected to other stuff. So Euler doesn't walk around town. He's the first lisper because what he does is he invents the tool. He spends so much energy inventing the tool and then as soon as he invented the tool, the problem is trivial. So Euler invents the graph theory for reasoning about connected structures. So might have taken him a little bit of time to do that, but once he was able to do it, he was able to say, actually, no, emperor. Um, despite the fact you are almighty and awesome, uh, you cannot travel the seven bridges of Konigsberg without retracing your steps. For in order to do so, each bridge would need an even number of entry and exit points to facilitate that. In this specific case, it would need exactly two. And you can see that this graph does not obey that rule. There are, there are bridges here which have odd numbers of entry and exit points, implying that you must traverse it at least once and maybe more I'm pro oh no, sorry, more at least, exact, more than once. <laughs> oh. So yeah, anyway, the emperor has to suck it up because mathematics. But what this then leads to, 275 years, 276 years later, is this amazing explosion uh, of analytical tools that we call the graph theory, which are useful in computer science, in discrete maths, but also useful in retail. They're useful in anthropology and sociology. They're useful in so, so many different fields of endeavor right now. We're used to them as IT people because we see graphs everywhere. We see the social graph, the interest graph, the retail graph, the fraud graph, the blah, 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 blah. Everything has a graph nowadays. You know, like so we have, you know, Facebook, for example, popularized the term social graph. We have the graph of telecoms. So we have the uh, internet and, and uh, telef telephone network provision, in uh, this case, in the United States. We have some kind of science, I don't know, physics, I guess, that has a graph. I have no idea what this means, by the way, just to show that graphs are just very, very broadly appl applicable. This isn't a graph. So uh, when I was watching the, the Amazon keynote uh, just before, uh, and he showed a graph. Uh, ah, that's a chart, motherfucker. Uh, <laughs> chart. Can't my relational database already do this? Well, no, actually. As it turns out, when you try to emulate graph-style operations uh, in a relational database, you end up doing that thing. You, you, you've probably got one of these databases somewhere tucked away at work, and it's got, you know, kind of the th two or three column join table, and you recursively join through that table, and you fear it because at some point your queries just go <laughs> and you don't know when that will be, but you know, you have maybe confidence in one join. You're sort of prepared to take your chances with two. Three, you get a bit nervous and start blaming it on the other guy. By the time you get up to five joins, the, thing's not, the query's never going to return. And it's just kind of sucky. But there is a book. Of course there's a book. And uh, you know, so I, I thought, well, you know, it's called Joe Selko's Trees and Hierarchies in SQL for Smarties. I hate this book. 
I've got to tell you why I hate this book. So, firstly, it, it's kind of really arrogantly titled. Secondly, oh wow, I got a PhD. That makes me pretty smart. I'll read this book, learn about trees and hierarchies in SQL. I'll seem pretty clever. Started reading the book. Fuck, it's hard. Got to about the second chapter. I'm like, oh, fuck it, life's too short. So fuck you for that book, uh, frankly. That was a very, very despicable thing to do. Yes, you guys are smart enough to read this book and build trees and hierarchies in SQL because you're smarties, but you shouldn't have to because technology's moved on and actually building trees and hierarchies is far better. In fact, building graphs is far better in relational tech. We don't want this kind of stuff this accidental complexity nonsense. We don't want to find a bunch of clever patterns and workarounds that go against the grain of the natural set-based model that SQL embodies. We just want to describe the real world. Again, you guys can see through this. You can kind of infer that some customers have some accounts. And if you're really, really clever, you can see that some of these customers share accounts. But wouldn't it be nicer if we could just describe that rather than have to talk about join tables and other accidental complexity? Sure it would. Let's do this then. This is a true-to-life representation uh, domain model uh, that we would store in a graph database. You can see I have a customer who's called Alice, and she owns this account with $100 in it. Alice also owns this account with $632 in it. Our customer called Bob, who owns uh, this account with $632, and a customer called Bo same customer Bob owns this account here. Being able to ask questions now, even simple questions about ownership, are very, very easy. What accounts does Alice own? Follow the relationships. They're named and they're directed. Alice owns this account. Alice owns this account. Alice owns two accounts. But interestingly, the reverse, also easy. Hey, who owns this account? Oh, it's Alice and Bob. Because in a graph database, you can traverse the relationships in either direction at the same minuscule cost. So you can ask who owns and what it, who is owned by. You can ask those reciprocal questions trivially. You can think about this you know, even in a social network. Who are my friends? These people. Who is friends with me? Not necessarily the same people, right? And you know this particularly when it comes to love. And you are IT people, and I guarantee you've all been through this. You love someone. That's someone, let's call them a normal. Um, you love them with all your heart and soul and they don't even know you exist. <laughs> All you are is the person that tells them, turn it off and turn it on again. Uh, and they go out with their good-looking friends to all the fashionable bars, and you don't exist. A graph database can express that rather unfortunate fact very inexpensively. So we call these, in graph terms, relationships. Uh, ironically, we were just talking about a lack of relationship a moment ago. We call these things nodes, and nodes have labels, and they can contain uh, property data, and relationships have names, and they can also contain property data. And this is it. I promised you I'd teach you the labeled property graph model. When you learn SQL and relational databases, you had to read a book this thick. That book was tough. Here's everything you need to know about the relational, sorry, the labeled property graph model. It's in one slide. Admittedly, I cheated. It's quite a wide slide. What have we got? We've got nodes with labels, optional labels, and optional properties. We've got relationships, which are named and directed, and they can have optional properties for things like weightings and so on. Relationships always have a start node and an end node, and the start node and the end node can be the same. So you can express Jim loves himself. So how do we model with this stuff? Well, like any good IT project, we start with a whiteboard. And my friend, uh, Chris Leishman, a colleague of mine at NEO, lives, uh, he's an Australian guy, but he lives in San Francisco. And Chris spends a lot of time with customers. And that means for him, he has to fly a lot. And uh, in the USA, I have to say, internal flights are unbelievably horrible. Um, I mean, they, the amount of carry-on luggage they have and the physical body size of your fellow passengers and the fact they're shit and they always get cancelled and blah, blah, blah. It makes it awful. Chris also thinks these things are awful. I mean, imagine if every single flight you went on was Ryanair. <laughs> you can see why Chris wants to be slightly smarter about this. So what Chris, is, what Chris has done for a long time now is gather flight data because he wants to look for patterns that suggest whether or not a flight he's planning to take would be a good option or a bad option. In fact, so he starts off by modeling this by talking about a flight and where it comes from and where it's going. So he says, you know, I've got this notion of flight, and, and flight has a destination airport and it has an origin airport. 
And in fact, then I can start to uh, pin these down to specific airports that I'm interested in traveling between. So some flights between JFK and San Francisco. Fine, that's fine. And then we can kind of grow that graph out a little bit. And we can sort of say, well, uh, SFO Airport is in San Francisco and uh, JFK Airport is in DC, right? muttering here. What are you muttering about, right? That's, that's definitely correct, yeah? No. Oh, descent, finally. No, no, of course not. You're right. DC is, JFK is not in DC. Interesting property of graphs as an aside. When you zoom in into a local graph, errors stick out like a sore thumb. So unlike, say, uh, you know, columnular data where you just pour through, then you kind of get tiredness, and uh, yeah, it's all tick, it's fine. Uh, Graphs, you st errors like this just stick out so, so easily. Interesting property of graph visualization. But those flights can be delayed by weather. They can be diverted to other airports. They can be canceled because of mechanical faults. They can even be canceled because of act of God. And whereas in Europe, act of God is a euphemism for unforeseen things, in America, act of God is literal. <laughs> so um, we decided that we'd build this in a relational database. And we ended up with a schema a bit like this. And you know you can kind of see what's going on there if you're if you're relationally minded. I've I can kind of figure out. Yeah, um, it doesn't really want. It, it's not as, as nice as my previous slide, but I can kind of figure it out. And then we actually got the intern to write the SQL for us. The reason we got the intern to write it is because we've all forgotten SQL because it's horrible and we don't use it anymore. The intern could still remember it, and the intern wrote this SQL. This SQL is full of fail. Why? Well, it's quite a big SQL uh, statement, and it's got one, two, three, four joins. It's super complex, so I have no confidence in this at all, because even if it's correct, it's got four joins. The chances are it's quite clunky, therefore it's probably incorrect. And, the si and, you know, and all you're doing in this SQL is building up a big, big set of possible answers, only to throw most of them away at the end. Awesome. Thanks, SQL. Fail. Remember, we've got the graph, and one of the lovely properties about graphs is that your queries emerge as a natural consequence of the structure of the graph. So how does this look if we queried this graph in, in Cypher, in Neo4j's query language? Well, we've got a full graph here, something like that, and you can see things like, you know, I've got uh, various uh, airports, uh, various flights from one airport to another, blah, 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 and you can see that, you know, flights have been redi redirected and delayed and all this kind of stuff. So this is some real data that my, my colleague Chris has, or a subset of the real data that my colleague Chris has gathered over the years. How might I, uh, I capture that? How might I query that and ask it whether a flight I'm considering is likely to be good, bad, or indifferent? Well, it turns out that I've got the structure, and the structure gives me my query. So if I simply rewrite the graph I'm interested in, in ASCII art, this is the first step towards generating a query in NEO. Because NEO's query language, called Cypher, is based on, it, we, we, we think of it as ASCII art for graphs. So in this case, I've drawn the same graph here, or same subgraph. I've got some flight F, which has an outgoing origin relationship to some other node O, origin. Same flight F has an outgoing destination relationship to some node D. Then I've got uh, same flight F has an outgoing cancel by relationship uh, to some reason. If I bring these together and drop the cipher uh, uh, keywords around it, I actually have legal Neo4j query syntax. I can simplify that slightly. And I've effectively taken that graph structure, dropped it in to my match clause, and now I've got my graph query. I'm saying, hey, database, find me the pattern where I've got some, uh, some node which has an incoming origin relationship from some other node, where that node has an outgoing destination relationship to a node D, and where that same F node has an outgoing cancelled by relationship to some node R. Then I'm binding these nodes. I'm saying, well, this one represents SFO, and this one represents JFK. Then I'm saying, ask me for, uh, ask return R, the reason, return me the name as reason, count them, and order by count in a descending fashion. So tell me the top reasons, this says, tell me the top reasons why flights are cancelled between JFK, uh, sorry, SFO and JFK. If you run that, or if you ran this uh, a few months ago when Chris last updated it, you'd find that these uh, are the top counts why these flights were cancelled. Uh, weather, carrier, and National Air Traffic Control Service unilaterally cancelled them. So in fact, Chris will then use the graph to try and find, if he finds this particularly suspicious or he finds this a particularly awful route, he will then use the graph to try and find other routes, maybe change in Atlanta, change in Chicago or something, to get from uh, SFO to JFK with minimal effort. So 
that, that's the theory. That's the modeling theory and the kind of query practice. Uh, can we do this stuff in front of a live audience without embarrassing me? Maybe. So how would we do recommendations? And I realize that you guys are from a whole different bunch of domains. But I think one of the things that we all know how to do, or at, le at least we've all seen, are things like retail recommendations. So when you log into Amazon, and it says, people like you also bought these things. I'm always embarrassed when I see those. It's like, people like me buy that shit? Oh, weak. Um, so can we do this? So the second thing I did when I, when I, got near for, when I learned near for j uh, was an, I, I worked uh, for a supermarket doing a proof of concept uh, around um, doing a proof of concept around recommendations. So in the old days at the supermarket, what would happen is I'd swipe my loyalty card, and then a little bit later, through the post, maybe a week or two later, I'd get a letter and some vouchers for, for money off or something like that, trying to change my buying behavior. And so uh, that's okay, but what the psychologists at the supermarkets understood is that um, that doesn't have a great effect in changing people's behavior because most of the time they pick up the letter, oh, this is spam from the supermarket, and it just goes directly into the bin. Now, it turns out, it turns out that um, humans aren't, aren't psychos, mostly. I, I know that's hard to, to believe sometimes, but... Lent them an air of legitimacy. Many of these big, boring organizations are even in Germany, which means they are boring and safe enough even for the Germans. You guys are far more exotic than that. There are excellent uh, books available. There's my book on graph databases. There's Rick Van Bruggen's book called Learning Neo4j. They are all available for free as ebook downloads. So if you Google for Neo4j ebooks, you get these full free books for free. We pay them. You, we pay for them. You read them, enjoy them. And that's all I've got. Thank you so much for listening. You want to come and talk to me afterwards? I'd be really happy to talk you through. Have a lovely rest of the afternoon. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you very much.